Whoa, what the hell was that? What takes a plastic body defunct brand Econo shitbox and turns it into a fire breathing monster that keeps up with exotics? Well, that's an LSJ, baby. And we're gonna learn about it all right now. Picture this, you're roll racing in your R35 GTR and you're wasting some Civics and wasting some other exotics. And all of a sudden, some little shit box pulls up. Oh, little Saturn, easy kill. But then it goes W-O-T, what's up? And you are getting taken to Gapplebee's. What the hell was that? That's an LSJ. Hi guys and welcome back to our channel Lightspeed Fieros. We got a really special episode for you guys today and but before we get into that we really would like it if you just hit that subscribe button and also hit the notification bell because that's what allows us to keep bringing you this really great content. Now we really aren't talking about Fieros at all today are we Rose? No Alex we are actually going to be talking about a very beloved uh, car family and that to us is the Ecotex. More specifically, we're gonna be talking to you guys about the 2.0 LSJ. So Alex, we have an LSJ inside of our Saturn Island Redline. I know I love this motor, but what exactly is an LSJ? Well, Rose, that's a super good question and one that you guys have been asking in the comments. So we figured we'd answer that right now. By the early 2000s, GM had acquired Swedish manufacturer Saab and combined efforts with their Saab automobile powertrain to develop a version of their twin cam four-cylinder that could withstand the rigors of being boosted. It came with an all-new reinforced sand cast aluminum cylinder head and cast iron cylinder liners. In addition, they added piston cooling jets, an oil cooler, and sodium-filled exhaust valves. It came with a water to air intercooling system that stock was easily upgradable. And what does that all add up to? Basically, this motor has been known to withstand some mind boggling abuse. What about tuning? Uh, an upgradable motor isn't very useful without tuning, right? Does it need an aftermarket engine management system? Well, that's the beauty of it. On top of all of that, GM shipped LSJs with a PCM that was flashable and easily tuned. But don't take our word for it. I'd like to introduce an expert in the field of LSJ modifications, Al McClure of ZDP. He is one of ZDP's top tuners for the LSJ and holds some of the awards for the fastest half mile and front wheel drive cars. Al, tell us what your experience is with the LSJ engine. When I started with my car, um, I originally just wanted a fun daily driver, and being a gearhead at heart, I started modding it left and right. Um, I didn't really plan on being a tuner, I just wanted to tune my own car, and I just kept pushing it farther and farther and farther. I ended up making 317 wheel horse on E85 of my car that had, the, uh, had a ported supercharger, LS4 throttle body, I believe it was on a 2.6 pulley. No, that was on 2.5. Um, ported head, cams, springs, long tube header, 3 inch exhaust. It, all of those are just off the shelf stuff. Anyone could do that. Um, I didn't even turbo swap my car until it was well over 200,000 miles. The compression was still over 200 across the board because I, I took good care of my car even though I had pushed it so hard on the blower setup. Um, that was non-intercooled with just meth injection in the charge pipe to keep the intake temps down. 
Um, and that made 460 wool horse on uh, Precision 5531. Is that the limit of what can be had with the stock block? So after I had ran the non-intercooled setup, I got to what I felt was the limit of how much hot air you could actually push in the cylinders. Uh, ended up going to a full front mount intercooler setup with the Saab intake manifold that's pretty much the standard LSJ turbo setup. Uh, the turbo I had was a, S, a Borg Warner S362 SXE. That ended up making 598 horse on a stock block with used ZZP rods and used diamond pistons that I think the pistons were in their third or fourth engine and the rods were in their third engine. Um, so like even in the aftermarket, these parts are incredibly durable. On um, that setup, I ran 161 in the standing half mile. Um, and I ran around the 160 mark for a couple events. Um, after that, I did my first compound turbo setup, which is incredibly rare on a gas engine. Um, that I used the same 362 but compounded it through an S246. Um, it's not a readily available turbo unless you look in like the diesel world. Um, took that to the next half mile event expecting to do really well since I could get the bottom end up a lot quicker and ended up having a bunch of clutch issues that kind of wasted the day. I think I still ended up running like in the 155-ish range or somewhere in the low 150s. Um, that setup was a lot of fun to drive because you had the initial spool of the tiny turbo but the crazy top end of the big one. But, but when I did that, I uh, it was kind of one thing after another, put one part in then make the next one fit. And it ended up being such a pain in the butt to work on that when I finally did have to tear that down, that I didn't bother putting it back in. So I say all that to circle back around to the a bone stock engine capability. Um, there's a good friend of mine, uh, T-Stone, he had desire to push the stock bottom end, see what it could really do. We ended up making 567 horse on his car with a Sidewinder turbo setup. I believe he was also on, yes, he was also on a 362. Um, made that power on a complete stock bottom end, aside from uh, ported head and cams, I believe. He also had a custom intake manifold, but as far as the engine goes, it was stock from the head surface down. Um, he turned it down from there, went on to drag race it uh, the whole rest of the season uh, at around like the 425, 450 horse level. Uh, he ended up running a best of 11.3, I believe. Um, the anti-lag and from the, we use a watt box for the anti-lag on that car, uh, ended up taking his toll on the oil pump. The oil pump fell apart, had to tear that engine down. And when he tore it down, we found that all four of the rods were bent a little bit. Um, so it was pretty crazy to see that the rods actually bent, presumably from when we made that 567 wheel. But he still raced it the entire season uh, and had no issues with the engine whatsoever. I mean, we never would have known anything was wrong if it wasn't for the oil pump finally giving up. What happened after that? I heard ZZP seek you out and offered you a job. I mean, I guess with upgraded internals, what kind of power can be had? So yeah, ZZP, uh, I had some guys that I'd been friends with there for a long time. Uh, having my own side business, I was somewhat of a competitor, but I was always really good friends with them. Uh, talked to them here and there, talked to them at events, email them when I had some odd questions. Um, and they contacted me and, and wanted me to come up there and join the team, uh, which was the best decision I ever made. Um, it was while I was up there that it came time to tear down my compound setup. Um, I was so angry at how difficult it was to work on that I just went back to a single turbo setup with the, uh, it was just a off the shelf ZZP racing short block with the option of diamond 10 and a half to one pistons. And the turbo I chose was an EFR 7670. Uh, for those of you familiar with the Borg Warner turbos, it's essentially uh, like a S257 just with a ball bearing center section and the Gamma Tie lightweight turbine wheel. <clears throat> so that set up, when I got it on, got it all together, got it on the dyno, it ended up making a 580 horse on about 28 PSI. Um, our dyno can only run to 160 safely and my fourth gear goes well, well beyond that. So I had the dyno in third and that was the limit of what I could get it to hold on the dyno on the street tires. And I didn't, I'm not really a dyno queen guy, so I wasn't going to put slicks on, strap it down tighter just to try and get a better number. Um, 
took that, went to the next half mile event, and I reset my record with 164 mile an hour in the standing half. Um, there, I was out of wastegate spring, and I ran uh, several passes back to back right in that range. Um, we had another event the month later. The, the atmospheric conditions were a little bit better. And I still was stuck at 164 back to back to back. Um, a friend of mine had me just crank the springs together and turn it up. Uh, I ended up going all the way to 40 PSI and it only got me to 167 mile an hour because what I found is I was at the limit of the drag and traction combination. So the aerodynamic drag versus how much power I, actually, I could actually put down. The, turning the car up over 100 horsepower only netted me about three mile an hour because it just you couldn't push the air or couldn't push a car through the air anymore. Uh, the tires were tripping all the way through fourth gear on that 167 pass. And if you want to go crazy, go beyond that. Uh, way back in the day, one of the ZZP shop cars made 880, 898 wheel horse, and that was using almost all off the shelf parts. Um, there's a different intercooler, I believe, in a turbo that's not listed on the site. But all those are things that you could get and you could do it yourself. I mean, that's getting into the six, seven hundred horse range is really just a matter of you putting forth the effort. It's nothing crazy. Thanks, Al. As some of you know, we aren't just Fiero junkies. Our other passion is the Ecotech family. We own a 2004 Saturn Ion Redline that's tastefully upgraded with a Hathrop TVS 1320 supercharger and a port and polished head from our friend at Category V Portworks, as well as E85 fuel. With this combination and supporting mods, the car makes around 365 wheel horsepower, and that can increase if the fuel system is upgraded more. Speaking of porting the head, I have a few clips from Josh over at Category V Portworks. Josh has been porting LSJ and other Egotech heads for years, by enlarging and smoothing the ports in the intake and exhaust passages, the head flows better, reduces boost friction, and therefore heat. And what does less heat do? Less heat allows denser air charge and more timing before detonation. I mean, what's the bottom line, Alex? I only understood about half that. Why didn't you just say it makes more power? It makes more power! Well, how do we make all these changes and keep it safe? One word, tuning. Without proper tuning, any engine could go extremely lean and blow itself to bits. Whenever I do major tuning, I call my tuning partner and mentor, Emerson O'Hara. Let's call him now. Hey, Emerson. Hey, Alex. Emerson, how long have you been tuning and how many vehicles have you helped tuned, would you guess? I started tuning about a year after I purchased my red line, so this would be the summer of 2015. Uh, I began tuning because I really wanted to get a hands-in on my own car and I thought it was really interesting and it's become a really great hobby for me. I don't do it as a business per se, but I do help tune a lot of people I know's cars. So I've done about 11 vehicles uh, ranging from M62s, turbo swaps, TVS, E85, gasoline, uh, including a 3.8 supercharged as well and a 2.2 2 .2 liter Ecotech as well. What's your current setup and how much power does that make? About two years ago I switched to a turbo LSJ setup. I'm utilizing ZZP's front mount intercooler with an S257 turbo with a 68 AR housing. Running about 22 to 23 PSI of boost with the 85, I was putting down, I would say, 425 horsepower, which is about as much as I could do without spinning in third gear. After a while though, because my car is my daily driver, I switched back to using 93 from the pump and I had to lower my timing down a little bit and my boost to PSI or two. And right now I would say I'm running about 390 at the wheels. It's still a lot of fun. What are the advantages of an ECU that's designed to be tuned versus a full aftermarket setup that a lot of people go with? The main advantage of using a stock ECU to tune is how cost effective it is. By using HP tuners, you only have to spend about $100 per car and you can write right over the GM calibration. 
you can still make a lot of horsepower doing it this way and you can still pass emissions testing if you set it up right. Here's one of my favorite questions. What are your favorite things about the LSJ platform? What makes the LSJ platform so great is how easy it is to work on and how easy it is to tune. There's no EGR, no variable valve timing, and it's multi-port fuel injected, which means essentially as long as you can measure the air, you can tell it how much fuel to get. This makes tuning super simple because you just have to scale the tables for the injector size and then dial it in with a wide band. Emerson, you tuned a 3800 supercharged Fiero with us, and soon you're gonna be working on our turbo LSJ swap. Obviously, this comes down to personal preference, but what do you think about the LSJ versus the 3800 V6 that a lot of people put in their Fieros? The LSJ is a bit more of a modern engine design. It's still very simple like the 3.8 supercharged, but it utilizes a dual overhead camshaft design with two intake valves and two exhaust valves per cylinder. This with improved head flow also allows you to make more power at higher RPM versus the 3800. Thanks Emerson. After all of this info, you can see why we're interested in putting an LSJ into our Fiero project. If you've never seen it, check out our Project LSJ Fiero playlist on the front page of our channel. We're taking a T-top Fiero from the literal grave and bringing it back with the modern heart of an LSJ. I have personally swapped a few powertrains into different Fieros for myself, my friends, and different clients of mine, and I am quite ready for the challenge. Thank you guys for tuning in. This was a really different pace video for us, but we felt it was super important for you guys to understand why we chose the LSJ engine. If you like this kind of content, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to receive notifications for our latest videos. If you like this video and you want to see more like it, please give this video a thumbs up so we know to keep creating content like this for you. And one more thing is we want to thank you all for helping us reach a thousand subscribers with your support. We couldn't do this without you. Uh, tune in next week for more Project LSJ Fiero, and we will see you guys next time.